Siblings and sisters and brothers, welcome to Thursdays for the Soul. My name is Reverend Dr. Chris Davies, and I'm so excited to be here with you and with our guests on this beautiful day. Thursdays for the Soul is a webinar series to care for the whole of the church and beyond. Our topics are wide ranging and expansive to what is necessary and attentive at this time. They're everything from congregational resources to psalms and worship to interviews with key leaders and teachings about how you can plug, plug in with our co-creation of a just world for all people along the way. And today we will be engaging conversation alongside the authors of To Offer Compassion, um, which is a history of the clergy consultation service, um, uh, which is D.A. Dirks and Pat R Patricia Ralph. And we'll learn more about the expansive network of the time and hear the testimony of Reverend Dr. John Donna Scopper and Executive Director Elena Remzi of Faith Choice Ohio, all alongside Dr. Sherry Warren the United Church of Christ's Minister for Gender Justice along the way. So that's where we're going today, but I want to let you know where we're going thereafter in case you want to tune in for more. Next week, we have a conversation uh, happening, which is pre-recording about sharing leadership in the United Church of Christ. And a week after that, we'll be having a conversation um, about accessible to all churches and disability justice. Um, so to register for any, uh, either of those, you can um, go to the ucc.org, scroll all the way down and go to our events and you'll find the registration links there. Finally, if this conversation moves you, and if this work kind of carries you along the way in your faith journey and justice journey, consider donating to the annual fund of the United Church of Christ by texting UCC to 41444. And we can continue to put on programs like this. Oh, and y'all, I am so excited for today's conversation. You know, the, oh, let me start with this. You know, second wave feminism talked a lot through multiple voices in a community way of the, the personal is political. And this conversation is personal and political for multiple reasons, not only because we are in a post row era after the Dobbs decision, um, but also because as people who, um, you know, as a person with a uterus or as somebody who might need an abortion at some point in my life, I, I want access to that. Um, additionally, I want to speak to the fact that even here, I'm so delighted, and I'll say this in their introductions, um, for the overlaps of the ways in which this is real. Let me introduce to you the folks who will be joining us today. First, uh, Dr. Sherry Warren is the Minister for Gender Justice in the United Church of Christ, and she's newly on board at what a time as this. Um, she is a social worker, professor, scholar, advocate, and spiritual seeker originally from Kansas, which we are enthusiastically representing right now. Um, and uh, she brings us with uh, what she calls herself as a reluctant Christian walking in the footsteps of Jesus, but brings us her wisdom and joy along the way, uh, as well as her curiosity and leadership in the United Church of Christ. Um, Alongside uh, Sherry, the authors of To Author Compassion include D.A. Dirks, and D.A. Uh, has facilitated workshops on two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer questioning, plus uh, human rights, anti-racism, anti social justice, and leadership at universities, high schools, nonprofit orgs, and beyond. They were diagnosed with a young onset Parkinson's disease in 2017, and they're navigating the challenges of living with a chronic illness. So when they're not working for liberation, DA runs with friends and rescues cats, but not simultaneously. Uh, welcome, DA. <laughs> And then Pat Relf, Patricia Relf, is a freelance writer, mostly of nonfiction books for children, but she's also this co-author with DA of To Offer Compassion, a history of the clergy consultation service on abortion. She served on the board of her Planned Parenthood affiliate in Michigan and now lives in Cleveland, Ohio, near two of her three grandchildren. Additionally, Pat's daughter, Emily, um, is the midwife who delivered my baby. So when I say that this is personal, I mean intimately personal in ways that just uh, completely blow me away with the work we do and the relationships we hold doing it. 
Um, Reverend Dr. Donna Scopper is our next guest, a senior is the senior minister at the Orient Congregational Church and an early co-founder of the Clergy Consultation Service, which helped pass Roe v. Wade, a member of the Janes, and a group of women who performed safe, illegal abortions in Chicago, uh, and the mother of, mother of three and grandmother of five, and has written frequently about her own abortions. Welcome, Donna. And finally, uh, Elena Ramsey is the executive director of Faith Choice Ohio, which elevates the moral power of faith communities to expand abortion access and advance abortion justice and reproductive freedom. Elena is a formal fundamentalist evangelical and practices compassionate care as a pro-faith, pro-family, and pro-choice Christian. She's currently pursuing ordination with the United Church of Christ and is writing a book right now on evangelical, exvangelical support for abortion. Uh, in addition, Elena is a very dear friend and is going to help baptize my baby on Sunday. So we're, you know, it's all connected. I will say, though, that it's not just in these personal places because reproductive justice is so much bigger than that. Reproductive justice, as defined by Sister Song, um, is the ability to have children, not have children, parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities and have personal autonomy throughout all of that. And that encompasses so much. And I know that many of you listening are seeing your own work through a lens of reproductive justice. And I wanna encourage you to continue to make these intersections real and name that as you go. Ooh, that was a lot and so much brilliance all alongside. Everybody, you know, loves somebody who has had an abortion. God loves somebody who has had an abortion. All people who have had abortions. As we go through this conversation, you'll notice that our language is attentive to people with abortions and women. Uh, and along the way, that's intentional because we know that anybody with a uterus can have an abortion and that includes non-binary siblings or folks who uh, carry uh, trans folk who have uteruses as well. Uh, so we're attentive to that in our language and we'll be kind of using the both of that throughout, both and beyond. Oh, but let's talk about choice. <laughs> so I know in preparation, I was working with the Minister for Gender Justice, Sherry, about how we're going to have this conversation. And you were talking some about this. So I want to invite you to kind of uh, speak, speak some more about choice and, and the work we do together. Thank you, Chris. One of the things that I noticed as I was reading the book to offer compassion was that um, most of the clergy who were interviewed repeatedly said things like, even though what I was providing was, was counseling, there really was not counseling in the sense of these women who came to me did not need help making a decision. These women knew exactly what they wanted. They needed access. And that was something that, that struck me and that still strikes me today about this particular topic. We find that people with beans always have a choice. We are in the position yet again or still that people without means don't necessarily have a choice. They really need the access. And I think that's one of the most profound statements or, or um, undergirding ideologies that came through in the book. So let's talk some about that. Let's go deep into the history. Uh, Patricia and DA, I wanna uh, step back and invite you to kind of speak to what you learned over the course of these interviews and beyond. Thank you. Um, when we started on this book, we had no idea that it would become so relevant again. We certainly hoped it wouldn't, but it is. Um, back in the 1960s, uh, when abortion was um, illegal, basically everywhere in the United States, uh, it, in New York City, in Greenwich Village, an ecumenical group of liberal clergy used to meet at Washington Square Methodist Church in Greenwich Village. And most of the uh, uh, ministers and rabbis that were in that group uh, had already been involved in the civil rights movement. They were involved in the anti-war movement. 
They had been involved in poverty issues. And they gathered to talk about exactly what we're asking ourselves now, what can we do? Um, almost all of that group's members were men because that happened to be who was mostly ordained in those days. Um, and abortion was uh, illegal or extremely difficult to obtain throughout the US at that time. But a few of the clergy in the group had had previous experience with abortion counseling. The Reverend Howard Moody, who was the minister at Judson Memorial Church, later um, uh, Reverend Scopper's church, um, was a Baptist and he had his first uh, such experience in 1957. He had accompanied a woman to a, a, a house in New Jersey for an abortion. Uh, when the woman who opened the door saw a man was there with the woman, uh, slammed the door in her face. Um, a member of Moody's congregation was able to give him the name of a, of a reliable doctor, and he, he later found a, a doctor in Puerto Rico to whom he referred many um, NYU students and others for abortion. But for most of that group, abortion counseling was something new. Um, in New York State, uh, again, state by state, laws were changing the opposite way they've been changing lately. Uh, different states were trying to reform abortion law and make it more liberal in those days. Uh, and at that time, recall that it was generally Republicans who were in favor of liberalizing the abortion law because they wanted to allow doctors to practice as they wished. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a women's rights or abortion rights real, really approach. Um, the, the Democrats were often against this, this kind of reform. Anyway, a reform bill uh, failed in New York State in 1966. Uh, there was another reform bill in early 67 that again failed. They had hoped it would pass, but when it failed, uh, they decided they needed to act and do something. And they were pushed to act by an author named Larry Later. Uh, he had written a 1966 book called Abortion. And as a result, he started getting hundreds of phone calls, letters, and requests from women uh, and people seeking abortion. Uh, and he did do some abortion referrals, but it was too much for one person to do. And he pushed the clergy to start making their own referrals. So that group of clergy started to educate themselves. They met with doctors to learn about abortion procedures. They met with people who had had abortions to learn about the experience. And they met with lawyers from the Civil Liberties Union who, who gave them legal advice. And they advised that they should operate openly, never, uh, never admit that what they were doing was illegal, though, I mean, they, it pretty clearly was. <laughs> um, and don't appear clandestine. Be open about what you're doing. Um, their clergy status uh, gave them some protection because um, uh, pastoral counseling is considered confidential and has, as they called it, the sanctity of the confessional. And for that reason, all the counselors were to be clergy um, and no money was to change hands. The referrals were just considered part of their ordinary jobs as pastoral counselors. Uh, they, should, they should counsel only in person, never by phone or by letter, they would have to refer out of state uh, so as to confuse jurisdictions if, uh, if anything came up. Um, and although some of the clergy, um, always being activists, wanted to make a public point by uh, committing civil disobedience, the lawyers advised them that not to get locked up because they couldn't help anyone if they were uh, in prison. So I'll hand over to, to DA to continue. Sorry, of course, because I'm moving, my internet has decided to completely destabilize and now I have flop sweat. So hopefully this will all work out and I can continue to build on what Pat has said with no interruptions. Uh, thank you, Pat. Wonderful as always. Um, so the clergy who were involved uh, would uh, refer to only licensed physicians, importantly, um, preferably ones who did the procedure in an ordinary clinic or office setting, not in some back alley situation somewhere. Um, and that, of course, uh, 
brings us to one of our great heroes, uh, Arlene Carmen. Uh, Carmen was a longtime activist who became the administrator at Judson Church in 1967, though herself uh, had been raised as a Jewish person. Uh, she became active at uh, Judson, and uh, one of the anecdotes that we heard about her was that she would sort of be found smoking at the back of, uh, of, the, of the worship hall uh, most Sundays. Um, as the clergy consultation service began its work, uh, Arlene Carmen became the administrator and much more for the group. She kept the master list of approved doctors and in fact would visit doctors who were perhaps being vetted herself, posing as a pregnant person uh, in search of an abortion. Sometimes she was actually on the exam table with her feet in the stirrups before she revealed her real mission like the superhero she was. Um, and uh, she uh, uh, then also asked women in other parts of the country to help do a similar vetting process. Uh, Arlene also kept a blacklist of doctors who overcharged or who were uh, disrespectful or violent towards their patient, used unapproved methods, or did not use sterile techniques. So um, these doctors would be eliminated as possibilities if they did not meet the stringent uh, requirements that Arlene had set in place. Um, on May 22, 1967, the New York Times published a front page article about the launch of the Clergy Consultation Service on Abortion, or CCS. The group's answering machine was immediately inundated with calls from abortion seekers across the country. Um, and the clergy could only help them though if they came to New York City for in-person counseling. The service received calls from other clergy in Los Angeles and New Jersey, for example, who wanted advice on how to start their own chapters. And the Reverend Howard Moody, um, another one of our, uh, the great Reverend Howard Moody, began recruiting fellow clergy in Philadelphia, Chicago, and elsewhere around the country. By 1973, when Roe v. Wade, Wade made abortion referral unnecessary, the CCS had involved about 3,000 members across the country, including some social workers, nurses, seminary students like Reverend Scopper, and others who referred hundreds of thousands of people for safe abortions. When New York State finally did legalize abortion in 1970, the group also set up an outpatient clinic in New York City called Women's Services to provide low cost abortions. It drew patients from across the country. Again, they were inundated with people coming from across the country. The statistics from that clinic's first year of operation showed how safe outpatient abortion was and was published in 1972 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman wrote the Roe versus Wade decision at the Mayo Clinic Library just a few months after the article was published. So it seems likely that he took the women's services statistics into account as he wrote, for a group that was mostly middle class, mostly white, mostly male, the CCS was quite a radical liberatory organization. Um, and that's where I will leave things. I, you know, so, <laughs> Whew, as I was reading through everything and re-engaging material and learning new material, as you know, as Pat said earlier, I can't believe how continuously relevant this is. Um, and I want to lift up a couple of pieces that struck me and invite your uh, engagement as well. Um, you know, the first is that one of the first conversations that the group had in your writing was about whether or not to use the word abortion. Um, and that's still something we see today. Um, so, you know, I'm curious how that's, how that strikes you and resonates, even as you're in the conversations now. It seems to me absolutely heroic, actually, that they were trying, made, they made a very uh, concerted, uh, intentional effort to destigmatize that word. It was a word that in those days, certainly most men probably had never even heard that word. And they, um, they did talk about names for their group that would work around it, but they decided in the end that people needed to be able to find them and know what they were offering. And, uh, and they wanted to make it open and, and accessible. So uh, there, it... were, uh, there, were, um, there were chapters around the country that made the other decision and decided to call it, uh, call themselves the, you know, the uh, 
consultation service on problem pregnancies. Um, it, it just varied uh, from place to place. That The Chicago group, for example, called themselves that. You know, I, it strikes me too that there's, um, thinking about the formation, I think, was it the New, the new Jersey group that, um, Oh, my question is completely gone. <laughs> we'll find it again, or we won't. <laughs> um, so one of the other things I wanted to make to, to lift up in the midst of that was that it's clear that this work is so centered on a strategy of organizing. Um, and it seems, uh, it, it seems like that, you know, when we, when we reflect back in the sphere of it, you know, as it's as it's um, taken on a life of its own in storytelling post going into the history and the book that you've written and the, the sources, um, you know, places where I hear it, it's just like, well, we should just like, it just kind of happened, but there's deep strategy involved from the very beginning. Um, so I wanna invite you to speak to some of that or some of the pieces that you saw that really illuminated that along the way, particularly when not everybody agreed. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think there are a couple things. One, I, I think, is um, that the group had, in some ways, this was an activist group of clergy who had worked on the anti-war movement, who had worked on civil rights together. And so they knew of each other in terms of who was going to potentially step up and take this on as another kind of a civil rights issue. Um, in particular. And I think, um, you know, again, credit to the Reverend Howard Moody, who, who said, ultimately, this was an important thing to offer people who needed abortions, to offer them compassion, to not judge them or condemn them or shame them, but to simply offer them a place where they could be held in compassion in their time of need. And I think that was really something that was really fundamental to this group as well, that they didn't center themselves as clergy people who had a certain moral authority at the time, um, but they really centered that these women needed and people needed access to safe abortions at a time when they wouldn't otherwise have had them. So I think, um, you know, I think the spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit guided them, but also practical organizing that they had learned on the ground in the anti-war and the civil rights movement also helped them strategize in a way that was very effective. The other piece that I, you know, I just found deeply illuminating was the cost of this work. And I don't mean that in terms of like currency, although that is completely a part of it as well. But the there were a couple of stories that were really clear that there was a cost for the clergy folk in terms of their own um, community engagement, legal stuff and beyond. And I'm thinking about the LA chapter um, where the, the pastor in that chapter was fired because, um, and I wanna quote this because we could so easily hear this today. And I know that some of you listening have um, along the lines of, of course I didn't have this bookmarked, good job Davies. Um, but it was along the lines of in the paper, the um, moderator said something like, while we appreciate the social justice efforts of the pastor, it's really clear that he's not quite as involved as we want him to be in the church decision-making and attending to the needs of the members. Um, and you know, we hear that today in various ways. There is a cost to being on the front lines and we're gonna hear more about that in a different way momentarily. The other piece I wanted to raise was the Presbyterian pastor in Cleveland who was put up on essentially a fitness review um, for doing this work. Uh, and, and while that outcome was in his favor, um, it still happened. Um, and those are the stories that, you know, even as we're in that work in different ways today, the folks who are more radical or the folks who are in communities, there's, there is a cost. And there's also places where the congregation is 100% behind it, like Judson. Um, so, uh, you know, to that end, before we kind of move to hear more from Reverend Dr. Donna Scopper, um, is there anything else you want to add, DA and Pat, about this uh, with welcome to add in throughout the rest of our conversation as well? I, I guess I would, just, uh, I would just add that we found it surprising that, in fact, only out of all those, uh, all those who participated in this basically illegal activity, uh, only one actually ever appeared in a courtroom up on charges. That was Reverend uh, Hare in, uh, from Cleveland. And, um, you know, uh, charges were brought, uh, you know, there were charges, you know, thought, uh, contemplated, I guess, against a couple of others, but 
Um, and I think Dr. Uh, I think Reverend Scapper had a uh, had a slight run in with the police, but it, it was surprising. The police, the DAs and uh, the prosecutors in most instances uh, understood why this was a needed service. So it was surprising to us how little legal repercussion there was. So let's hear a little bit more of the, the, the testimony and the story of it, but I wanna, I know Sherry, um, let's see. Um, from there, I, Sherry, you had some observations you wanted to share along the way too. So let's, um, I'm gonna invite you to do that as well. Well, I think one of the things that astounded me in the book was this um, sort of idea woven through that it was mostly men involved in the clergy consultation service because most clergy were men and they were using their power to help folks. And somewhere along the way, the, the gift, if you will, the work of their power that they felt was so essential got turned into a different narrative of they were the keepers of the, the access. And that struck me. And so I was hoping that Reverend Donna could speak a little bit to her experience of that. She was with the Janes. She was working alongside of some of the folks from the CCS and um, what the perspective was about the people who were involved in the counseling of the CCS. So welcome Reverend Donna, come on in, tell us about then and now and all in between as you so desire with three main points. Oh, well, it's a, it's a great lead in question. So thank you very much. And thank you uh, so much for the historical uh, reprise. You don't do such a big history in, in 10 or 15 minutes. So, so much was there, including this important question about how the women receiving the services felt about receiving them from clergy uh, and clergy men in particular. Um, it was, they were so uptight about being men that they combed all the divinity schools. And by the way, there are 12 seminaries in Chicago. Uh, and they did the same thing in the New York area where it really did start New York, New Jersey, but then expanded because of a friendship between the university chaplain, Reverend Spencer Parsons, who was at the University of Chicago. And it, it really was a kind of networking uh, that took it to Chicago. And one of the things they wanted to do was make sure that there were women involved, that they it wasn't men doing it. Um, and so they trained a lot of seminary students and they paid us to work, which was amazing. I don't know where they even found the money, but I saw a notice on the bulletin board at the University of Chicago Divinity School that said, uh, ministers in training needed to do problem pregnancy counseling. And it was like, I, it said, we'll pay well. <laughs> and I thought, okay, that sounds good. And I didn't even know how I felt about problem pregnancies or exactly what that was. You know, what did it mean? Uh, uh, it felt a little dark and mysterious, to be honest. Um, but I ended up uh, with the chaplain, Spencer Parsons, really close friend of Howard Moody's, who I really didn't know until much later when I arrived there. And uh, 2005. So, so as Reverend Donna's internet is stabilizing uh, again, um, I, you know, I just want to again have some uh, names, so, so much and, gratitude. And, all this. and, um, and there, and there, so, and the African-American women would stand outside and come in one by one, and we would counsel them about access. That point that was made about it wasn't 
they knew why they were there, <laughs> right? They wanted to find out, was it gonna hurt? How much did it cost? And did I really have to go on an airplane to New York? So I hate to tell you, but we did all of this in about 15 minutes per person over a four hour period. Uh, and there were about 20 of us in a crowded room working with people who would come sometimes with a companion, but mostly by themselves and mostly women who were at least 30 plus, between 30 and 40. Again, somebody has the stats on it, I do not. Um, and we would talk to them. And the first thing, we are not here to tell you what to do for obviously good reasons. And then they say, okay, I know what I want to do. Show me. And we would show them what it looked like to have an abortion. We had the uh, medical tools. We had a, basically a doll and we would show them what would happen. And we would uh, be very, um, I don't know, it got almost blase, you know? People say, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. How much does it hurt? How much does it cost? And at that point, it cost $300 round trip. And more of the time would be spent on people saying, I have never been on an airplane before. <laughs> what if I get lost in New York? And we'd say, no, the New York people are going to pick you up. And so it's just a completely different world. All right. And uh, then we would meet with them two weeks after they had gone to New York to have the abortion and talk with them about it. And that was, I think, the more beautiful part because they would, we never saw a person said, oh my God, I'm in total trauma for what I did. Never. <laughs> what we saw was people saying, thank God you helped me get there. I'm so grateful. Uh, and they'd even say things like, would you pray with me, Pastor? about this, the return. It was a very moving experience. One night, and I wish I could remember it, the Chicago police busted our clinic with all the women inside and with our counselors, who by then were mostly women counselors who had been trained by the men. So to this question of whether the men were you know, being do-gooders or white saviors or whatever. They were not. They really wanted to get women to do this work with women and to the best of their ability they did. And they raised the money to make it happen. The Chicago police busted the University of Chicago chaplain basement because they thought we were performing abortions there. I mean, it was just classic Keystone cops. And they took us all, the clients and the uh, counselors, and they booked us. And then we had a no little van kind of staring at each other, laughing because they said, you cannot perform abortions in a chapel. And we, some of us were performing abortions in other places, but the idea that we couldn't do it in a chapel was hilarious to us. Um, so we just kept thinking they're going to find they're not going to be able to find any evidence that we had done it and we had not done it. So that was sort of my youthful experience with it. It was the first time I'd ever been arrested, and we were let go after about four hours of sitting around. Um, and it made the news, and frankly, all it did was increase our business, um, which was often a, a really big problem. Was you, you had to be good at getting an appointment. And we were running five nights a week um, and transporting people to the airport. That was the other part of the town. So that, that's a picture of clergy consultation in its, um, its intermediate phase. And I did wanna say, Pat, that one of the things I experienced with Howard that was most important was his immediate understanding that money was the issue. And, and working with doctors who wanted to charge, I think it was 350. And he said, no way, you won't get any referrals from us if it's 350, it has to be 300. And then it changed over time. But I thought that was brilliant work. Uh, and it goes to the question of access again. Uh, so I've been um, tasked to talk about the kind of intermediate place. And in thinking about this, 
I want to begin by saying, I never thought this would happen. So this intermediate place is a kind of, it's a shock. And, and I should have known it was coming because from my experience with clergy consultation in Chicago, and then as a writer, uh, because I decided I was gonna write about my abortions and, and they were two and the details are uh, very simple and I don't need to talk about them again, you can find the articles, but make it public. Um, and that put me on the, the circuit as a liberal Christian minister who was ready to debate the fundamentalists about it. So I debated Phyllis Shafway about, I'm gonna say 40 or 50 times on TV. Um, I was on the Oprah show. In fact, uh, you'll like this. When my, my baby, my first child was one year old. Oh, this is when Oprah was in, only in Chicago and she was on at 6 a.m. Um, I got all dressed up in my clergy suit and went downtown to her studio. And Isaac and his father were sitting on the, on the floor and Isaac kept saying, mommy, get out of there, get out of there, mommy, get out of there right now. And he was kind of right. Um, and when I got back, he said, thank you. I thought you were locked up in the television. Um, <laughs> that was his fantasy. Of course, Oprah was very, very good. Um, she was trying to help people get their heads wrapped around the moral issue of abortion. And I do think it's a moral issue. And unfortunately, the right gets it uh, so wrong that that eventually will bite them uh, severely. And I think that's what happened in Kansas yesterday. I really do. People just don't believe that women are not supposed to be humans, not supposed to have freedom, not supposed to be adults uh, in choice making. Yes, please. I was going to say, I think that, you know, uh, with just a, a moment to finish your thought, but that does bring us to where we are today and how we can, how we can plug in. So I right. apologize. Yeah, no problem. I think uh, where we are today is that the religious right has gone berserk. Uh, it's unchristian, it has nothing to do with religion, but I experienced this on the road for about a decade. And I noticed the way I experienced it, and I really burnt out. It's the only time in my ministry that I genuinely lost my innocent faith. Yeah. It really, I said, you know what? One day, when you debate them, they don't listen. They are cruel. They make their arguments by sarcasm and berating. But let's let's pause there. And I know Elena has brought in her own experience coming from the fundamentalist faith um, to bring into the conversation as well, uh, in right. addition to her leadership of Faith Choice Ohio. Mm -hmm. All right. Welcome, Elena Ramsey. I know that you've been doing so much of this work. And as we think about where we are and where we're going, um, when I have questions about how to answer answer these questions today, you were the first person I think of because you have the answers. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know how to say more than that about it, but let me step back and let you speak to, you know, that, that personal transition um, from fundamentalism to where you are now, as well as where we can plug in. Mm, yeah. Well, for all those tuning in, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer, I don't have all the answers. I, I pretend <laughs> with the best of y'all. Um, but what I have done is um, the work that we are all called to do, right? It is to, to question um, our faith. Uh, I was part of a fundamentalist tradition that did not allow questions, did not allow me to wrestle. And um, and it took a lot for me to get to a place where I could begin to do that and question, particularly um, when I was told that issues of reproduction, sexuality, um, that those were anathema to the church, that one would go to hell if they had an abortion or or are gay. And, and it wasn't until I was in relationship with people and mm -hmm. I got to hear their stories that I got to understand that this is a bigger, deeper conversation that needs to be rooted in our lived experiences. And so it's by the grace of God that I can do this work today. Um, and I give such great gratitude to DA and Pat and Donna um, 
because of your storytelling and your witness, that was part of my journey. It's part of my journey of seeing like people can change their minds. People can be public and vocal and unapologetic about their values. And yes, it will come at a cost. And for me, that did come at a cost. It came at a cost of losing community, um, losing people who then thought I was backsliding, of course, right? Like how dare I now lead an abortion justice group that is religious? Um, but I do that because of this book, to offer compassion. Uh, this that you all have authored, Pat and DA, um, is what guides me, it's my moral compass, that as a Christian, I am called to offer compassion, that how I was living my life before uh, was, was steeped in so much shame and judgment uh, and condemnation of others, and did not reflect the Jesus that I know. And so I started to bring that lens into my work and recognizing that people deserve um, access to health care and regardless for any reason and not just to hard cases, right? Um, and I come to this work as a rape survivor. And so it's not just because people experience rape or incest or, um, you know, the extreme cases, you know, to spare the life of the pregnant person, but it comes down to bodily autonomy and whether or not we believe that people are moral agents, that they have free will, and that God imbues them uh, with that right. And so I really do my work on the shoulder of giants, like all of you. Um, you know, I hear about what you're doing, um, what you've done in the past, Donna, and the reason why Faith Choice Ohio is so strong is looked to for a lot of answers is because we know our history and we have learned from the lessons of the past. And we have learned that counseling still continues today. It's a core part of our work because even today, people continue to wrestle with harmful theologies and the weaponization of religion. That's a core part of our work. We counsel people on all options and help them understand that it's really up to them. It's not about what the church has to say, what the government has to say, but people know, people know already what's right for them and to follow their gut and their conscience. So all I have to say, it's been a journey for me and it continues. And I'm just so grateful to be among all of you and all the ways that we continue to show up uh, for others and for this movement. If I could, I think um, I have been struggling as I've read the book, mm -hmm. thinking that DA and Patricia were telling a story that they were part of. And I realize they are historians and researchers and storytellers who, who were drawn for many reasons to this project and who spent years collecting millions of bits of data to, to weave together this story and I so desperately would read something and want to somehow find DA or Patricia and ask them, so what did you do? Recognizing they didn't do anything. <laughs> they are the conduit through which this beautiful story unfolded. And- Which um, is everything, right? <laughs> oh, it's absolutely amazing. I would get lost. There were so many different congregations involved different important people who put so much on the line personally and professionally, so many women and people who were in need of abortions, whose stories are told somewhat through this. And so I am getting to a question here and I'm trying to make, uh, make sure that I don't put DA and Patricia on the line as the owners or keepers of this vast information. Uh, but I do want you to consider, I look at social media and I see things, um, I see memes of people, you know, just coming out of Kansas, Ruth Bader Ginsburg memes where she's wearing a collar made of sunflowers, the state flower of Kansas. And I'm seeing a lot of imagery of handmaidens from The Handmaid's Tale. And I recognize um, because I'm doing my research and trying to be as inclusive as possible, those images aren't necessarily 
images that speak to everyone. Um, for a number of reasons, Ruth Bader Ginsburg hasn't always had the best track record. And I feel like it's almost verboten for me to say that out loud. She hasn't always upheld or been as inclusive as she could be. And the, the handmaids are specific to one culture. So how can we continue to move forward using our privilege in whatever our identity is that, that gains us some to be inclusive? to do this work without coming across as some sort of keeper of the access or a moral authority. I, I ask you wonderful experts. Well, maybe I'll take a swing at that. Um, I mean, I think, so uh, you say Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a complicated person. Everybody's a complicated person. You know, we very much became um, fans of many of the clergy we interviewed because we didn't necessarily have a lot of academic distance from the folks that we interviewed. We really admired them and the work that they did and the, through the stories that they told us about their dedication and devotion to, to serving people who needed this important service, this medical service. And I think Howard Moody really um, was impressive to us because he really talked about removing himself from the center of attention. He may have been the spokesperson for the national organization, but he really didn't see the CCS as kind of becoming um, a reified sort of uh, institution, right? That, that continued to operate after Roe versus Wade, right? It was, it was once, that, once Roe versus Wade was passed, how could they open a clinic? It wasn't like, how can we continue to, to do this work with women? So I think it was very much, um, you know, that many of these clergy understood that they were, they were answering a call, but the call wasn't about centering themselves. It was about serving the people who needed the, the, who needed the service. And I think that was very important. So it didn't turn into some kind of institution that was run by a bunch of white men. Um, so I think that was really important. And I think it also provided a model. I mean, and again, the CCS was not perfect, right? We talk about in the book how um, there was this split in terms of um, after the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement kind of took up the attention and concern of many of the clergy. And so there wasn't a lot of Black clergy involved or recruited. And so that was problematic, you know, in terms of how the CCS operated. Um, so there's that flaw of the CCS. Um, but I think in terms of allyship work, it was very important, right? That this is how you work across movements um, and you work to center the voices of people who you are working in allyship with, right? So for many of these clergy men, it was, it was trying to make sure that women had a choice and were honored in that choice versus speaking for the people who were using CCS. And I think that remains true whether you're involved in racial justice or queer movement justice or uh, disability justice is that you work in solidarity with with each other across shared concerns, but you also let the people most affected speak for themselves instead of speaking for them. So I think that's crucial in the work in terms of how you do coalition work and allyship work is that the people who are most affected are the ones who should be taking the leadership roles and doing the speaking. I say this as a white queer person um, and recognizing my own privilege and my whiteness. Um, that I don't speak for women of color who use the service. I don't speak for clergy of, uh, who were black, who may not have been, who may have been removed from the service. Um, I speak for the voices that we heard of the women that use the service. And we definitely wanted the clergy themselves to speak through our book, to offer their own kind of witness of what they saw the women who use the service. So I hope that was a helpful and unrambly answer because I can be rambly. Perfect. I mean, in the way in which we are all imperfectly perfect. Um, but to that, I do wanna let uh, Elena speak to um, the work that's happening today because you are in the middle of it. Um, you know, Faith Choice Ohio is in my opinion, one of the most radical clergy groups and faith groups doing abortion access work today. Um, and I know that from attending their self-managed abortion trainings and teaching how we can use our language as clergy with intention that isn't necessarily on that same legal line and in the questions that um, came um, for in similar ways to the legal issues that came in, they were advised at the very beginning with Howard Moody. 
Um, so uh, as Elena is readying herself to speak. Um, just, I wanna invite you to talk some about what that looks like as a, an, a faith entity organizing today. And um, after that, pass to Sherry, and we can talk about ways in which you who are watching, whether with us live or watching the recording, um, can uh, plug in. And I will note that all of these things that we're talking about are resources that will either be emailed to you or are available beneath the YouTube if you're watching after the fact. So don't worry about trying to snag them all now. They, they're, they're down there. So go ahead, Elena. Thank you. So yes, yeah, so when I say that we've done this work um, rooted in the legacy and history of CCS, uh, that means our work at Faith Choice Ohio really follows a similar strategies. Uh, one, we recently launched the Jubilee Fund, which is a faith, the first faith-based abortion fund in Ohio, um, and the fourth faith-based fund in the country. And really how it works and what we're doing, again, it takes a page from what we've learned from CCS is engaging congregations. So we provide funds directly to congregations and my dog's all about this. Um, and then we teach people of faith on the ground uh, in those communities how to serve those who are directly impacted by abortion bans. And so we teach them how to be anti-racist, to be culturally competent, to be trauma-informed, um, and really to center those who are the most important part of this conversation. It is about the safety and the well-being of abortion seekers. And we do that because of our faith and not in spite of it. And so um, it's a really interesting model that we're using because Again, you get the clergy penitent privileges, uh, the protections that are covered for clergy who are providing some of this counseling support and direct service, and the religious freedom protections that congregations have um, are all tied up in that um, in ways that other abortion funds that are not faith-based are, are, are having issues navigating right now at this point. And so what that looks like practically, um, I think about, you know, when we're talking about privilege, that we all have a role to play. We have so much to offer in this movement, but we always have to center the abortion seeker. So when we are teaching people what that looks like, we have lots of folks who are super thrilled and excited about joining our driver program, want to transport people to other states and are ready to take that risk. And while we're grateful that they want to use their privilege in that way, we listen to what the patients say. And lots of folks don't want a stranger driving them. What they actually want is for us to coordinate a bus ticket or a plane ride. And so we don't make it about us. And same thing when people are like, hey, I have a spare bedroom and you know, I can host folks who are traveling and need care. And we're like, that's wonderful. And when we really listen to what abortion seekers are saying, they actually don't want to go through their medical procedures with a stranger in someone's home. They want a hotel room and they deserve that dignity. And so that's what it looks like to do this work in a way that is rooted in our values, that honors the dignity of um, everyone that we're looking to serve. And so lots of this work right now is folks learning. This is the most important part of it, this is centering folks, but learning uh, from those who are already doing the work. Um, that means black and brown led organizations like ours. Yes, getting all the hype from my dog here. Um, and because we've been doing this work for decades, there's no need to recreate the wheel. Like even us, the work that we're doing is based on what we've learned from the CCS. And so we have to start with ourselves. We've got to check our biases. We've got to uh, uncover those internalized stigmas and the ways that that gets in the ways. way of saying, hey, I want to be the savior here. And it's it's not. It's not about us. And so a lot of our trainings, um, check them out online, uh, faithchoiceohio.org forward slash trainings. Yes, we're based in Ohio, but we offer this online to everyone and anyone. And so uh, you can learn all about religion and repro, um, a lot of this history that we're covering today. And then we get into moral messaging, how you can speak from your values. And then, as Chris mentioned, um, we do these trainings on self-managed abortions because folks 
need to know that there are safe, effective, convenient options that aren't just based in clinics, but they're available through abortion pills. And so we teach you how to do that in ways that will legally protect you, as well as protect, again, the people that we are looking to serve. And so those are just some ways that people can plug in right now and just know that like this conversation about the CCS is happening on so many levels um, nationally and I'm part of groups that are looking to possibly reboot it, but we're doing it with a lot of care and discernment because we know things are different now. There's a lot more criminalization. Uh, so we're, we're looking at how do you build sustainable networks and ones that are patient-centered, but also ones that are based in states that are really attacking the problem at the grassroots level. Pause there and see if I can wrangle this one, who's just so thrilled, thrilled to be joining you all today. And I'll pass it on to Sherry. <laughs> Thanks so much, Elena. Uh, if if all of our viewers or any of our viewers sign up for some of Faith Choice Ohio's fantastic webinars and trainings, you might actually see me in your classroom. I am very new in this role, having started July 1st, and I am taking advantage of the fantastic resources of Faith Choice Ohio to try to get a handle on some of what has been going on with the work of reproductive justice, not just in my new state of Ohio or here in the middle of the country, but really nationwide, what kinds of things are happening. So um, while I am new in my position, if you would like to reach out to me, I would love that. I can help you do webinars. I work with the Washington office on advocacy trainings and watching legislation that is associated with gender and this topic in particular. Uh, I wanna reiterate what I think has been said repeatedly here that we need to center the voices of those most affected and most harmed by the legislation and policies that continue to um, make, make choice, make access, make safe communities to raise your children should you choose to have them. Um, those are the people who we need to be listening to, allying with, and centering in these conversations. And I'll stop there. So as we wrap up, I want to pass to Reverend Dr. Donna for any final word that you'd like to add in, as well as a prayer to hold us all and send us out into the rest of our day with deep gratitude to all of you listening, whether here with us now or live on the recording, we are alongside you in this work um, now and ongoing because we will not stop until we have safe, affordable, uh, accessible abortion for all people who need it. So as Reverend Donna's gathering her thoughts, uh, I just, again, I'm so grateful for each of our panelists for being present with us in your deep wisdom. I want to put the concept of canonic power on the uh, agenda and use it for the prayer. Canonic power is the way people like Howard Moody um, allowed a 35-year-old girl like me to be on national television talking about having an abortion or to touch the lives of people with uh, 24 hours of training uh, in order to connect and to give up their power and to spend their power. So here's my prayer. Oh God, may we get as much power as we need to make your way in this world. And may we give it away creatively, strategically, and always. Just like you did in creating us and giving us gender and giving us children and giving us fertility. And pretty soon, please, in hurry, reproductive justice too. Amen. Siblings and sisters and brothers in Christ, if this conversation has moved you, if what's been offered here has helped enhance your ministry or your soul, 
please consider donating towards the annual fund of the United Church of Christ by texting UCC to 41444. Your support will help programs like this in the essential work of the United Church of Christ. Thank you for your support. Be blessed into the rest of your day and know that you are not alone and we are holding you in prayer. Amen.